Good morning, everyone. My name is Menja Chaler, and I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice at City University of New York, and a co-founder of the Queer European Asylum Network. We at the Queer European Asylum Network, or Queen as we like to call it, are thrilled that you're joining us today for what promises to be an important and stimulating conversation around the Dublin Three return system and the challenges and risks such poses for LGBTQI asylum claimants and refugees within the EU borders. So today we have the immense privilege to be hearing from thinkers, practitioners and activists who have devoted their intellectual, personal and professional resources to amplify the concerns, as well as good practices around queer asylum law and policy in Europe. Europe currently faces an increasing threat of autocratic political regimes and civil movements that are determined to restrict the rights and freedoms of LGBTQI persons. These movements and politics become particularly relevant for the conversations to be held at this symposium today when considered in conjunction with the increasing militarization of EU borders, as well as the increasing criminalization of irregular migrants within and outside the EU. So the questions that animate this one day symposium concern the protection of human rights standards for LGBTQI refugees and asylum seekers living in EU reception countries. This symposium will touch upon the lived experiences of queer asylum claimants with Dublin Three, as well as the possibilities for solidarity between LGBTQI support organizations located in Eastern and Western Europe. So before we delve into the first panel, I'd like to say a few thank yous. On behalf of Queen, I would like to express my immense gratitude to my co-organizers of today's event. These are Irene Chen, Lili Draza, Daniel Chubilic, and Mohamed Dalla. Without their conceptual and moral support, this event would not have been possible. I would also like to thank our illustrious panelists who have so generously agreed to dedicate their time and knowledge to this symposium, as well as Ronya, who has brought the urgency of the topic of today's symposium to my attention. Last but surely not least, I would like to thank the Gundavana Institute for their generous support. Specifically, I express my gratitude to Julia Hartlepp for bearing with me as I navigate the administrative dimension of this event, and Dr. Ines Kappert, the director of the Gunda Werner Institute, for her incredible trust in Queen and her friendship. Thank you so much, Ines. And may I give you the word now? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Menja. Um, I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to this in, um, to this um, international conference, Kian made possible again. Since two years, um, you managed to do exactly what, or to implement exactly what um, the Gundarana Institute is, is here for, namely to bring to, together activists, politics, and scholars, and thus to, um, with the goal to overcome um, human rights violation and to enabling sexual self-determination, which is of course a human right. So since two years, you gave us the chance to learn a lot and you managed to bring the situation of queer refugees into the political discourse. And we all know that this is not an easy thing and it's amazing that you managed it. So I'm grateful that we can support you and I'm grateful that this second um, international conference will take place now. Um, um, I'm sure, um, that you that we will learn again a lot, and I'm I'm happy that this important political work will continue. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ines, for your really humbling words, and I think this goes for everyone who has put their efforts into all these events that we've been organizing over the last few years. Um, I think it really brings out the strength of collectivity and also the strengths of interdisciplinarity in working with activists and researchers and practitioners. Um, and I'm extremely grateful for all of those who have uh, contributed so far and I'm looking to for, forward to future endeavors. Um, and of course, for the panel today, which I'm really, really excited um, 
four. But before we delve into this panel, um, I would like to mention a few housekeeping rules. So the panel will feature two rounds, today's panel will feature two rounds of interventions outlining the challenges and recommendations regarding queer asylum and the Dublin III return system. Um, after that, we'll have then about 30 minutes left for Q&A in the end. So you will be able to submit any questions via the Q&A function throughout the webinar. Um, please be aware that this webinar will be recorded and also live streamed on our Facebook page. Um, so because there are quite a lot of um, registrations and hopefully a lot of attendees, we might unfortunately not be able to answer all the questions that you might have. And also please note that we're not able to answer any case specific questions that you have. If you have any questions in regarding to your case, please go to our website, uh, www.queereuropeanasylum.org where you find resources and further information. Um, please follow us on Twitter today throughout the um, symposium at Queer Euro Asylum and tweet about the symposium using hashtag Queer Dublin, hashtag Queer Asylum. So now the housekeeping overs, I'm really happy to open the first panel today. Um, moderating today's panel will be um, entitled Protection Standards Criteria for LGBTQI plus asylum claimants for readmission to safe EU third countries under Dublin III is the amazing organizer, activist and advocate Irene Chen. Irene Chen is a former consultant advisor for global LGBTQI plus refugee protection at the UNA, United Nations High Commission, Commissioner for Refugees Division of International Protection. She is an international humanitarian and development specialist with over 20 years of experience supporting forcibly displaced people in emergency and non-emergency contexts worldwide. A political sociologist by training and a member of the queer community, she has worked with the United Nations entities, governments and civil society organizations on protection policies and programs for LGBTQI plus and other refugees. This includes her work on social integration and governance and civil society development initiatives in fragile and stable states. She herself is the daughter of refugees. And Irene, a warm welcome to you. May I hand over the floor to you now. Sure. Thank you so much, Menja. It's really an honor, or a true honor for me to be with all of you today. I would like to thank the Queer European Asylum Network and the Gunda Werner Institute for inviting me to join this really critical and timely discussion. And I'm really honored and grateful to be able to participate. Uh, before I go on, I just want to note that during the discussion, we will be using the term LGBTIQ+, and I know that this is not universally used across all the agencies and organizations that are with us today. So basically, this is just a term to refer to people of diverse sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics. And we appreciate that this is not a universally used term. Uh, some organizations such as Eleni, the Council of Europe SOGI unit, are, are using sexual orientation and gender identity, and that is also fine. So if you hear me kind of switching back and forth between those two acronyms, just, you know, please bear with us. So before I get started, I just want to give a very quick snapshot before we go on and introduce you all to our, our esteemed panelists today. As you know, right now we have over 82 million people who are forcibly displaced worldwide, the highest number since the Second World War. This includes over 12 million in Europe, which hosts six over six and a half million recognized refugees, over one million asylum seekers, two million internally displaced people, and nearly half a million people who are stateless or undocumented. And at the same time, there are globally almost 70 UN member states that criminalize consensual same-sex relations among adults, uh, two of them, two additional states criminalized de facto, six prescribed the death penalty, 13 have 
laws that criminalize trans and gender non-conforming people, and another 37 target trans people through vagrancy, prostitution, morality, and other such laws. Within this context, Europe has long been regarded as a global standard setter when it comes to upholding the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and queer persons within its jurisdictions through the European Convention on Human Rights, as well as through its efforts to set out a unified, coherent, open, and fair system for ensuring international protection to forcibly displaced people in its territories through the Common European Asylum System, otherwise known as Dublin III. In late June of this year, so nearly one year after the EU's new pact on asylum and migration was presented by the European Commission, European Parliament and the European Commission confirmed agreement on a mandate to re-establish the European Asylum Support Office as the European Union Agency for Asylum with an enhanced mandate to implement the common European asylum system under Dublin III. I quote, it is a significant step in creating the world's only multinational asylum system. However, as mentioned, mentioned, mentioned earlier, in recent years, we have been witnessing the increasing politicization of both forced displacement and SOGI human rights in Europe with often devastating consequences for people who seek safety in Europe from persecution linked to their real or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics. We think about what happened yesterday in the English Channel when a dinghy capsized, 27 people lost their lives tragically. You may also think about uh, the very recent standoff on the border between Belarus and Poland in which a number of asylum seekers were caught in the middle and with regard to Soji rights, which Eleni will touch on in her presentation, out of the 47 member states of the Council of Europe, there are at least 10 that do present barriers to even the freedom of expression on this type of topic, which is to say that LGBTIQ plus asylum seekers in Europe do face multiple intersection challenges, and they are among the most marginalized and in many ways vulnerable groups of forcibly displaced people today. So given the complexity of the situation and of the ecosystems in which it is evolving, it would appear that to ensure the protection of LGBTIQ plus asylum seekers and refugees in Europe, this will require the courage, creativity and commitment of a very broad range of people including yourselves, who work across sectors, geographies, and cultures. So we're very honored today to be joined by four experts who will be speaking on the panel and who have very graciously agreed to share a bit of their own experience and perspectives with us. I'm going to begin by introducing our four panelists, and I would just request that those of you who don't have your camera on, turn it on so we can all see what you look like. We're going to begin with Suma. Suma, are you with us? So while Suma is turning her camera on, I'll just let everybody know, Suma is a trans refugee from Egypt, an activist. Hi, Suma. And Hi. a consultant. <laughs> Welcome, Suma. Living in Berlin, after having worked as a public relations manager and executive secretary for a dental company, I should also note that Suma is a trained lawyer as well. She worked as the leader of several groups in Europe uh, that work with LGBTIQ plus refugees, including the Tea and Talk group in Istanbul as a consultant for the Imantes organization, which is based in Athens, and as a previous coordinator for RFSL Stockholm Newcomers Group for LGBTIQ plus refugees. Um, between 2017 and 2019, Suma has served as a board member of TransFest Stockholm, Trans Newcomer Stockholm. She co-founded several LGBTQI plus asylum networks, including Transgender Europe's 
Trans Refugee Network. And during the last three years, Suma has been a guest lecturer at DIS Study Abroad in Scandinavia, where she has taught students about the very specific challenges that trans refugees face. Welcome, Ms. Suma. Thank you. Next, allow me to introduce you to Rania Carroll, a mediator and lawyer with an LLM in European law after previous positions in Frankfurt and Geneva. Since 2015, Rania has been working in Munich as a lawyer specialized in asylum law with an increased focus on the LGBTIQ plus community. She considers herself not only a lawyer, but also as a consultant and an integrator for asylum seekers of all kinds. She would like to create awareness for the implications of the Dublin procedure as they impact LGBTIQ plus refugees and asylum seekers specifically. Welcome, Ryan. Next, may I introduce Akram? Akram Kubanich Bekov, whom some of you may know is the Senior Advocacy Officer at ILGA Europe, also trained in international human rights law. Akram works on developing and implementing advocacy strategies and policy initiatives aimed to bring legal, political, and social change for LGBTI people across Europe and Central Asia. LGBTI asylum and migration are some of the key thematic areas of his work. And prior to joining ILGA Europe, Akram also worked in the UN in the regional office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and Central Asia and has been involved in queer activism for nearly 15 years. Welcome, Akram. Finally, we have the great honor and pleasure to introduce Eleni Tateku, a lawyer and specialist on minority issues and vulnerable groups. Eleni is joining us as the head of the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Unit, uh, unit of the Council of Europe whose mission is to fight against discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression and sex characteristics in Europe. Eleni previously served in the Council of Europe on Roma and Travelers, where she was responsible for the promotion of integration policies and inclusion policies in the 47 member states of the Council of Europe, and Roma women and girls were a particular focus of this work. So please give a silent round of Zoom applause for our four panelists. And uh, with that, shall we begin with a discussion of the key challenges that each of you feel LGBTIQ plus displaced people face in Europe, and also some of the challenges you face in your work to support them. So we're gonna start with Suma, and then we're gonna go next to Rania, Akram and culminate with Eleni in order of progressively increasing scope. Okay, so Suma, as a trans refugee who has lived in several European asylum countries and who has had a very extraordinary journey in your own search for safety and dignity, could you share with us some of the experiences that you and other LGBTIQ plus asylum claimants and refugees have lived through under the Dublin Three regime. Thank you. Yes, so first I would like to uh, say that I am so happy to be here with all of you today and extremely happy to be able to talk about Dublin regulations because this is something been very uh, annoying for the last five years I've been working. I left my Egypt five years ago and I started my activism work. Uh, as Irini mentioned that I started uh, groups in Athens, Sweden for supporting LGBT refugees and networks in Europe. And this been like a huge issue. People when they get forced LGBT refugees, when they get for, uh, forced to be displaced uh, this is something not easy. They need to seek safety where they cannot be reached by their family members, their relatives, their friends, uh, people they used to know in their home countries. 
So it's difficult to be in the country that you've been able to get visa to like, for example, if some uh, family member send me an invitation to any European country and I go to that country and I'm afraid to stay there because I need to seek asylum and I had to move to another European country. So Dublin regulations will send me back in unhuman way. Uh, I had a case in Sweden, she was a trans woman from Syria. She traveled to her with her family to Germany and she couldn't stay with her family because of her safety. And she been sent back to Sweden, from Sweden to Germany, to the same city. And she had to stay in the same camp because this was the only camp in the city and she had to be reunited again with her family. And we lost the contact with her. She couldn't be sent back. She, and they didn't listen. They didn't consider her, uh, the risk of her life. And they told her literally, the police can protect you. And the police, we all know, they need time to arrive. And I need a chance to be able to call the police. So this is not applied. And actually since she, she been sent back to uh, Germany, we lost the contact with her. And she been, before she sent back, she was in the detention camp. Uh, usually Dublin uh, units, they give their decisions uh, within three weeks and maximum you need like three to six months to be able to send back to the country you entered the first and the, the country they consider this country should uh, examine your case. This is not fair. And uh, when a Dublin regulation goes to LGBT cases, it doesn't serve its purpose because they have reasons to move. Like for example, my case, I've been grand, I have residency in Greece where I didn't get anything. I've been abused so many times and I moved to Sweden and it needs for, they couldn't give a decision right away uh, within three weeks. And we had similar cases. They gave the decision within three weeks, but I had to wait eight months because they were confused. They couldn't decide and they couldn't justify the decision. So, and I've been, uh, the returning way wasn't really like, they lied to my face. I asked them, how would I face the Greek police because I'm afraid of the Greek police. I will cooperate, but would, would you hand me over to the police? And they said, no, 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 we don't care. As long as you are in the plane, we don't care. And actually when uh, the plane landed, the police arrested me on the entrance of the plane. So they lied to my face and they asked me to cooperate, but they lied, they didn't cooperate. And then they told me, we cannot say another European country is not safe. And due to Dublin regulations, we have to send you back. I moved to Germany again, because I cannot stay in a country where I cannot feel safe and I cannot get basic support as asylum seeker. In Germany, I am waiting now for 24 months for a decision because Dublin unit itself, they cannot give a decision. The people who are supposed to be expert in Dublin regulation, they cannot give a decision. So this is really very weird. I am now no decision yet. And I have to wait like, I don't know for how long, forever maybe. So, uh, and this is really for, from the Dublin uh, units in the migration offices, they cannot decide because it, it, we reach the point that Dublin regulation cannot be effective for LGBT cases. Things has changed a lot. And if it works with some cases, the main thing of Dublin regulation, as I read, as I understood that they don't want the refugees to be able to move around Europe freely and they don't, uh, they all go to one country and leave the other countries without uh, not handling uh, cases for refugees. And this is not helping the LGBT cases at all. People have been uh, abused in some countries. I had cases from France, they are, from Algeria and they moved to France and they moved to different cities. And in each city, they meet a family member or a neighbor. 
it's been difficult for them and they went to Sweden and they've been sent back because due to Dublin regulations and it was also escorted by the police in the plane. Another case also went to, uh, they've been sent back to Greece with the police escorted on the plane as if they are international criminals, which is, make us, we are, uh, LGBT refugees, they are used to be afraid of the police. And suddenly I have to be seated near to the police in the plane, transported and handed over to the police in the other country. This is something destroy the... Uh, mental states for the refugees and we've been talking about cases like this uh, so trying to support them uh, psychologically which is difficult also in Dublin regulation there is one excuse when you have a family members or a wife a brother an uncle a father you can be go to that country and the Dublin regulations will not apply in your case uh, uh, I was reading this this morning, and this is really difficult because LGBT refugees, they are escaped from their families. So we've been denied that right. That excuse we've been denied. We cannot use this as an excuse because we don't have, our friends consider our family. Our boyfriends and girlfriends consider our family. So it's not allowed, I had a case in Netherlands and they need to move to Sweden for, to be uh, with his boyfriend and they didn't consider, they asked him for marriage certificate. They came both of the, one from Iraq and one from Syria. And they need them to get a birth certificate from Iraq or Syria to move to, to live together. This is, uh, make things not uh, right. For me, if someone asks me, get a per, uh, marriage certificate uh, for uh, your boyfriend from Egypt, how could I do this? It's, it's impossible. So when they have excuses, we are not included in this excuse. And we cannot, they don't consider our friends who've been together for years, our, 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 our family. They don't consider boyfriend or girlfriend. And this is totally wrong. And as I mentioned before, if a family member send me a, an invitation to come, I, I cannot stay in this country. I'm afraid this country is here. They said move to another city, try to find out, but it's like in the communities, it would be easy to find me. And it's really easy for the families, the relatives to take, you are a big shame for them. So they act aggressively when they found out that you belong to the LGBT community. Uh, also, a case has been uh, written as a, in the detention camps. The detention camps, they put the people in the detention camps in an uh, human situation for the LGBT mainly because they have to be housed with people they been coming from the same background they came from, from the same country. They are not safe. They've been attacked a lot. And we had cases in Sweden in the detention camp and we've been trying to support. We've been, it's not easy to visit. It's, it's not a, a crime to try to move to another country to seek protection because you have reasons. It's not, you are not like need to take a trip to other uh, city, we, are, we need safety. And this is why we left here, our countries. Most of LGBT refugees, when they leave, they, when they've been forced to be displaced, they didn't do this because they get, need to get better life. We need to get the basics because we couldn't have in our countries. There is no police to protect me. There is no healthcare to support me as a trans person or there is nothing. So we need to get the basics. When we try to get the basics, they are like, this is Dublin regulation, go back. And there is countries like in the, the border countries, are they like, I don't like to name any country, this is bad and this is good, but the border countries cannot get, because of the huge numbers of refugees going there, they cannot get the, give the support the refugees needed. So they move and Dublin regulation send them back. So I think 
if we need to talk about this, the, uh, if I need to give any recommendations, and I'm sorry, I have to give my recommendations early because they have to go. But my recommendation is the reason should be considered. Any friend I can, we confirm our friendship, both of us, it should be considered as a family member. Because I need to, they, why they are united, the families? Because these people take care of each other and support each other. So my friend been supporting me for years before we come to Europe. And now I need still to be with my friend I consider my family. So reasons should be considered. We should uh, have the right to get access to the ex ex excuses in the Dublin regulations. Also, if I, I think Dublin regulations has, uh, from my perspective, to be deactivated against LGBT cases, because when we say reasons, uh, our uh, reasons should be considered, it will be relevant. So there will not be a, a, a specific rules they would follow. It would be up to the case officer to decide. So still it would be lost. So if I have like the power to do something about Dublin regulations, I think I would deactivate Dublin regulations against LGBT cases. And thank you for the, give me the time to talk. And thank you really for listening and being here for us today. Wow, thank you so much, Suma. We're sorry that you're gonna to have to leave us early with a powerful testimony of you know, someone who's lived through the way the Dublin um, regulation is actually implemented in, in multiple parts of Europe. And um, I wish we had a little bit more time with you to really dig deeper into some of these challenges that you and other LGBTIQ plus asylum seekers and refugees have experienced particularly on the question of family reunification, which I think is a much broader question. I'd love to hear what our other three panelists have to say about that and, and other aspects of um, reconciling credibility assessments with European human rights standards. So anyway, uh, Suma, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Asuma is available to be contacted by email for anyone who wishes to get in touch with questions. So we will post that in the chat uh, during the seminar. So we'll let you go, Suma, to your next appointment. Okay, okay thank you very much. Bye thank bye. Thank you so much. Take good care. Um, so following on what Suma has just shared, the criminalization of movement, it sounds like. Um, let's turn to Rania. Rania, as a, an asylum lawyer, working very closely with immigration authorities and also security authorities, what has your experience been like representing LGBTIQ plus asylum claimants in Germany, not only as a lawyer, but also as an advocate for safe and dignified integration to what are some of the implications of the Dublin procedure that you witnessed? First of all, I really uh, say thank you to, to Minja that, that she listened to me when I, when I brought up this, this topic to her ears because uh, this is really something I, I, I feel we, we need more to discuss about because as we got the testimonial of Zuma, uh, the Dublin uh, three uh, is completely in opposite of what those LGBTIQ plus uh, refugees uh, they they expect of our asylum system. So um, I, I want to start a little bit to introduce myself because I, I came I moved back to Germany in 2015, coming from another country. Where, where Germany faced this, what we call wave of refugees, um, where in Europe there was this, uh, this, this big, big moving. And I, 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 as I came also to Germany, not as a refugee, <laughs> uh, for other, other reasons, uh, I, I, I got in touch with the camp close where, where I moved to and in the discussion. And 
and I raised up uh, the the topic of asylum seekers in Europe uh, in somehow from the bottom up uh, because I I started uh, uh, with a volunteer and working there and so the first touch I really got was really basically in a camp we started with a t in a in, in a temp tent condition over there really really basic on now it's a building but um, I'm still in good touch with those uh, or a couple of refugees of, the, of this time. So uh, in, the, in the beginning, I was more in, in the general uh, uh, problem, but uh, I started soon in, in having the contact, what, what, what do they are facing on in problems with the administrations, what Suma also brought up. And then uh, I, I started more, they realized that I, I'm, I'm in somehow specialized. And then all of a sudden it, it started, it, I was in the beginning more with Afghanistan and, and Iraqis. So then all of a sudden uh, the social workers, re they recommended me and uh, um, I, I really was kind of popped into this LGBTI uh, plus problems. Uh, because I got in touch with uh, uh, some social workers from Fürstenfeld Brook, which is uh, called an Ankerzentrum in in Germany, and that's that's really some which is is very difficult. And so, uh, uh, one of the sudden, I was really uh, uh, smashed into this this different uh, problems of yes Dublin but uh, LGBTIQ uh, asylum problems in general even if they are already passed and um, that was 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 very interesting and, and and more and more for me that I, I I realized that this 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 Dublin is is really something which is in, in top what they are already facing on. <laughs> uh, and, and that was uh, so weird for me because I, I realized that in, in somehow uh, Germany is using this Dublin III, I felt more like as an instrument to get rid of refugees. That's something that we have in somehow to realize. All of a sudden it, it showed me up when I, when I, when I got a map to, to, to Europe uh, and I was asking myself, why did you, uh, Germany agreed at the time to the Dublin III um, accordings? And I said, yes, for sure, because uh, Germany is in the middle of all those countries and they are more and less counting through the effect that that few number of refugees will, will finally end up in their country. <laughs> and that was probably basically the main idea for what they said. Wow, that's a fantastic idea, this Dublin III according, because we are in the middle. So all, all the border countries, they will, uh, they, they will manage. And, and the idea of, of, uh, of solidarity and in terms of really sharing uh, all those refugees on the European context, that's what I, 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 I never felt as that's the intention, how Dublin is, uh, is, is organized also. So uh, that's, that's uh, in getting in it as a lawyer, all of a sudden you realize that here in Germany, uh, uh, really, the Dublin is really only based on the formalities. So, really, in seeing that we are uh, 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 respecting the delays given by the regulation, uh, and, and and seeing that we we uh, uh, we see that you know uh, we we try to get the decision in the delay of three months so that we can really continue in organizing everything that we transfer the people. Uh, so that's, that's really something what I, which, which made me really, really sad because if you have a look to the regulation, uh, the first problem which shows up if, if it's organized as, uh, um, as, uh, uh, as formal system, uh, the word LGBTIQ is is not showing up in the regulation itself. That's what what Suma already mentioned is uh, the the only group who's really kind of uh, taken care actually in the system or mentioned is families. But the definition of family is weird, and it's really what Suma said for for trends even 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 uh, unuseful. 
Uh, so that, that's what I realized was the first problem uh, in, for me as, as a lawyer uh, 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 in facing on the administration uh, to really explain them that we are talking about a vulnerable group who is also under the projection of the Dublin III uh, uh, regulation. So uh, that was, was really something I, I thought, wow, and, and then the next problem we, we are always facing is how in, in this Dublin um, procedure, how do, we, how, how, how do they are screened? Uh, child's uh, families are visible uh, immediately. When, that, when they come to those camp, uh, a pregnant mother, you can, you can almost see uh, that a child is a child. Of, you, you can see the difference between three or four years but might not be visible. But at least with all those LGBTIQs, yeah, the trans probably, and they, they get immediately faced problems, but, but homosexual, lesbians, they, they, they do not look. And, and it gets even more difficult because they, from their behavior, in the camp surrounding, they, they even try more uh, to hide in, in not, not uh, getting be outed. So what I do realize, at, at least for Germany, I, 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 I'm so sorry, but I, the, to grab experience for the other European pa countries, is, that's, that's uh, for me actually not, not really possible. But, uh, I was I was in in preparing this this panel today. Uh, I, I I checked, you know, already the catalog of of um, of questions. What what they do because in the in the uh, Dublin uh, regulation we do have okay we have implemented that there is a first a hearing for the people, but. Actually, for those hearings, there's absolutely no approach to those uh, uh, part that they might be part of the of, the, of a vulnerable group. Uh, all those questions they are only focused by um, the idea in which other country they had been, uh, or did they already applied in another country uh, for for the asylum. Uh, 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 already for asylum. So I, I do realize that when I, w I was really shocked because I got a really uh, highly traumatized guy in front of me and I was already happy that obviously the interviewer in the, in the Dublin uh, interview realized that this guy is really traumatized uh, he, he came to Europe with a visa for, for Italy. So he was sending him back with a delay of two weeks to bring more uh, psychology uh, medical reports. And I said, two weeks, that's mission impossible. Uh, even if you, if you need in Germany, uh, uh, an, uh, first of all, you need an appointment with an expert and, and you need to, to find somebody who, who, who is able to speak English. Um, and and so I I I I I thought okay in really applying uh, for a prolongation of the delay, uh, we might really in first of all earn time. And I had to figure out that it was this three months delay. Italy was not answering. Poof, the decision uh, turned out, and I was in a in a nightmare of of Dublin. Um, and then the next problem, what, what, what we as lawyers, we are completely also facing on is that uh, the regulation is not giving us the opportunity to bring those cases really in front of court because the claiming system what's established uh, is, uh, is, is, is so, uh, yeah, and somehow mean uh, because in, in this this way of remedies in, in, in terms of Germany has chosen uh, the, the way that if I do claim, uh, I do not have automatically a suspension effect. If I apply also for a suspension effect, uh, I, I'm in, in the entire way that I'm in, in somehow depending on the court that they decide and this kind of transfer delay of six months, months what we do have is, re, is, is really canceled and stopped. So 
for the for the safetyness or for the for for the for the needs of the of those refugees it's it's not helping me and then the next uh, very difficult point is and that's also something what we knew, what we de- what's what's implemented in the regulation is that the regulation was based on the idea that all those member countries, they are fulfilling the humanitarian criteria. And, and so uh, it is so, so it's, it's such a high barrier uh, to explain to court that really a transfer of those people to those other European countries uh, is, um, is against that, that I normally really recommend the people in, okay, you need to go through those nightmare of seek and hide what I, what I, what I say over those six months uh, up that Germany uh, is, is then uh, responsible for the case. Uh, the, the last point I, I want to add is I do also see chances in the, in the, in the regulations and um, that's what, what, what we also tried a little bit with the LSVD in, in Cologne now to, make, to bring in awareness that we have not this, as, as Suma mentioned, the, the, the family uh, part. We have the Article 17, which is the discretionary clause. And in my opinion, that should be really kind of promoted for something we should establish as once we have them, you know, seeked out or, or screened as part of the LGBTIQ communi- community, that we should discuss with those people where they want to stay, why they want to, uh, to stay, and to, uh, to use this, uh, this part in terms of making them feeling better. Well, thank you so much, Rania, for sharing your very challenging experiences having to navigate, I think, the, the administrative um, uncertainties or quagmires that you can encounter under this asylum regime. I'm really struck by what you said about the... Um, the fact that LGBTIQ plus does not actually show up in the Dublin texts as a category of protected group. And it sounds like from your experience that invisibility also translates into practice um, and it renders even more invisible the abuse that a lot of LGBTIQ plus people experience in those detention centers that you've worked in, right? Because to protect themselves physically and emotionally, some may try to conceal their sexual orientation or gender identity, et cetera, which does not make it easier to recognize uh, administratively or on a policy level, the real challenges that they face. And um, I find it really interesting the suggestion on using this discretionary clause to better address, perhaps through strategic targeting, the needs of LGBTQI plus people that are in displacement situations in Europe. And um, would love to hear more about that when we get to the recommendations section. Uh, also, Eleni, you have just mentioned that you're having some difficulty hearing people. Can everyone hear? Can people let the moderators know if they can hear all the speakers? Okay. So with all the kind of procedural and political challenges that Rania has brought up, from remedies to um, a perception that perhaps some countries in Europe are using the common European asylum system as a way to keep refugees out of their countries. Why don't we move to Akram? Akram, you represent one of the most influential LGBTQI plus human rights organizations in Europe. Would you help us understand a little bit um, how ILGA Europe 
approaches the asylum policy in the European Union, what are some of the protection standards and challenges that you have seen LGBTIQ plus asylum seekers go through under Dublin III? Probably as many of them would reach out to Open Europe for support. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Irene, for the question. And hello, everyone. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here digitally with you today and take part in this plenary discussion and thank organize, uh, I would like to thank also organizers for inviting ILGA Europe uh, to, uh, to talk about the uh, challenges for LGBT asylum seekers, uh, specifically under the Dublin uh, city uh, regulation. And as I'm uh, representing ILGA Europe, uh, allow me please introduce ILGA Europe briefly. Uh, ILGA Europe uh, are independent international uh, non-governmental umbrella organization, uh, bringing over 600 organizations from 54 countries in Europe and Central Asia. Uh, we are uh, part of wider international ILGA organization, but ILGA Europe uh, is established as a separate organization. Uh, um, operating in the region of U Europe and Central Asia. So uh, on our approach to the policy so that we work on the standard setting and advancing uh, legislation uh, on the European level um, and uh, with our members at the national level, uh, we also support them in improving laws and practices at the national level through advocacy, strategic litigation up to European Court of uh, Justice or European Court of uh, Human Rights. And uh, yeah, uh, so this is uh, briefly about ILGA Europe. And I would like to start with uh, some of the protection standards for LGBT asylum seekers that are provided under the EU asylum law that are uh, relevant to the Dublin regulation. And uh, I will also touch mostly what is under the Dublin regulation, because if we will talk about all the uh, protection standards, it will be, I think, taking hours. Um, so that's why my, my intervention will be really very focused. Uh, so uh, throughout the uh, Dublin procedure, uh, uh, the regulation provides a number of guarantees for applicants at their rights. Uh, and these include the uh, right to information that at the very beginning, as soon as application uh, for the international uh, protection is lodged, um, a member state should uh, inform about all the procedures and uh, all the rights uh, the applicant is having in, in the language that they will understand. If it's needed, they should also provide the translation. These are the standards, uh, which can be a little bit differently understood by different uh, member states and implemented differently, although uh, regulation uh, means that these, uh, uh, these provisions have direct effect in all EU member states. And uh, then uh, also they should have like personal interviews, a personal interview uh, with the applicant should be organized uh, to facilitate um, so determination of the member states. Uh, responsible for who will be uh, uh, um, uh, reviewing the application uh, for the international protection. And then uh, there's a special guarantees for minors because we also uh, see that uh, some uh, LGBT minors also might be reaching out, uh, out to the Europe and seeking for the protection. Uh, so prioritizing children's best interests uh, throughout the procedure and increase the protection for applicants uh, children, family members, uh, dependents, uh, persons or relatives, it's uh, uh, all related to the uh, families. Uh, and uh, here I would like to specifically highlight what's the best interest uh, for the child. If if a uh, child is not, uh, for example, LGBT child um, family is not accepting, then they, sh they should consider that if it's the best for the child to leave with the family who are not accepting identity of this uh, child. And of course, what was touched it already, it was the obligation to guarantee uh, the right to appeal against a transfer decision. And uh, the member states should also provide legal assistance uh, free of charge. And uh, upon request uh, at the appeal stage, some countries do it automatically. Uh, so uh, these, um, in addition to these provisions, uh, the Dublin Street Regulation make uh, makes a provision for vulnerability as a factor which may influence um, 
operation of the responsibility criteria. So as we know, there's a responsibility criteria which uh, uh, makes family and then uh, country of entry and etc. So there's hierarchy. And following that, uh, they find the responsible country. Uh, uh, and in our, as it was already touched by the uh, Ronya, uh, uh, Article 17, uh, Part 1, is known as a sovereignty clause, uh, uh, clause and then permits uh, a Dublin state to decide uh, to examine claim for international protection, uh, uh, even if uh, it's not responsible for any other reasons uh, uh, laid down in the Dublin Street regulation. So in other words, uh, this provision concerns, uh, concerns a situation uh, where there are exceptional compassionate circumstances, uh, such as individual human rights considerations, uh, that justify the exercise of discretion to examine uh, asylum uh, claim in the given state. For example, Germany uh, can decide, okay, uh, or Sweden can decide, okay, in the Greece, human rights standards are not really great for the LGBTI people. So that's why we can, uh, we, we will take uh, charge of this uh, case uh, and then we will consider it here without uh, uh, using the Dublin. And, and here also some guidance was provided by the Court of Justice uh, and European Court of Human Rights. And I will touch upon only uh, at the moment one of those that um, court considered that transfer in itself can entail a real risk uh, of inhuman and degrading treatment uh, within the meaning of Article 4 of the Charter. Uh, and notably in circumstances where the transfer of as asylum uh, Climate with a particularly serious uh, mental or physical conditions leads to the applicant's uh, health significantly deteriorating. And uh, in these standards, they also have, um, so therefore the authorities of transferring state uh, must take into account objective uh, factors such as medical certificates, which are capable of demonstrating the particular seriousness of person's illness uh, and the uh, significant and irreversible consequences that transfer may result in. Uh, and uh, furthermore, in operational terms, the member state uh, transferring an applicant to the responsible member state is also under an obligation to provide the receiving country with the necessary information about the, in order to safeguard the applicant's rights uh, about immediate special needs uh, post-transfer. For example, if the person needs some kind of medical intervention or, uh, or any other needs. Uh, and here again, a special mention is made for of vulnerable groups such as uh, disabled uh, persons, elderly people, pregnant women, renal minors, uh, persons who are being subject to torture, rape, and other serious forms of psychological, physical, and sexual violence. And the last criterion, uh, or, or maybe last two criteria, uh, are uh, very relevant to LGBT applicants because they uh, all, uh, often um, face high, uh, um, high uh, rate of violence and torture cases in the country of origin or on their way. And uh, some of them may even um, uh, face a torture. So, but uh, unfortunately, uh, they cannot understand what's the torture, and that's why these um, provisions sometimes uh, may not be used. Um, uh, I will touch upon about the uh, in in the challenges this part, and then Article Seventeen and uh, Part Two. It's also uh, has uh, it's called the humanitarian clause. And uh, it uh, um, it allows to also make an exception for the uh, for the humanitarian grounds based in particular on family or cultural consideration. And um, unlike the term uh, terms family member and relative, the term relations, which is mentioned here, is not defined in the uh, Dublin City Regulation. And the reference to family and uh, cultural consideration in this part of the Article 17 allows Dublin states to exercise their discretion, uh, uh, discretion rights to bring together individuals who are part of extended family group uh, recognized in a different cultures and countries. And it's very specific to the, uh, it might be uh, relevant to the LGBTI people 
and uh, they're de facto children, uh, depending on the interpretation of the member state. Uh, and then uh, that is also the notion of vulnerability can be a primary consideration uh, in the assessment of the legality of Dublin transfer per se. Uh, so that need for transfer uh, to come uh, for transfer to comply with the charter and then um, uh, European Convention uh, 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 trigger specific obligations on sending countries to ensure that an individual applicant will uh, have access to an asylum procedure and appropriate conditions uh, in the receiving country, uh, according to the provisions set out uh, in uh, relevant EU, um, in the relevant and uh, namely EU asylum procedure and reception conditions directives. And um, uh, these safeguards apply to all asylum seekers, but uh, notable judicial interventions in Dublin procedures have highlighted uh, special duties out to vulnerable groups. Uh, but I should note here that so far there was no cases involving LGBTI applicants at the court. Uh, but uh, considering the case law, uh, this provision can be interpreted as applicable to LGBT applicants. And um, also several uh, court rulings stress that sending countries have obligation to obtain individual guarantees that the transfer will comply with the standards of the, um, of the convention and then charter. So, uh, these are some protection provisions uh, provided by the EU uh, law for asylum applicants, um, uh, including uh, yeah, LGBTI people. And now I would like to highlight some of the impacts of the uh, Dublin system, uh, system on LGBTI applicants. Uh, uh, first, uh, I would like to share uh, some examples just of the real cases to demonstrate uh, how regulation can negatively affect LGBTI people. And uh, for example, uh, after applicant's family discovered his uh, sexual orientation, he fled uh, his country of origin uh, uh, because he feared his family would kill him. And then uh, he uh, first was uh, in Hungary, then uh, uh, moved to Austria and then his family also arrived to Austria, and then, according to Dublin, he would have to, uh, he would have to return to the uh, uh, or not to his family arrived to the Hungary as well, and then they under the Dublin they were uh, uh, united. But however, he expressed the concern that Hungary was not accepting and uh, affirming also LGBTI people, uh, and he will there face violence from. Uh, family members, uh, and um, I think I will just skip some of them because of the t uh, time limitations and just uh, turn into the challenges we see. Uh, so as uh, we can see from uh, the mentioned cases uh, by also by Suma, that one of the main challenges of the Dublin system for LGBT applicants is that the system is built uh, from hetero cis normative perspective, uh, which creates a system where there's a little understanding of the individual circumstances and needs of LGBT applicants. Uh, and uh, this perspective leads to the violation of some of the core principles of the Refugee Convention, uh, as such as non uh, refoulement and then individual assessment of application um, and uh, uh, yeah, application uh, protected by the Refugee Convention. And another challenge is the assumption on which is the Dublin 3 regulation is based uh, that asylum seekers are afforded equal rights across member states and each claim gets a fair examination uh, wherever the claim is lodged in the EU. And this is uh, far from being a reality. It was already mentioned by Ronia as well as with, uh, by Suma. And uh, we should also mention that EU member states uh, have a different level of protection for LGBT asylum seekers and in the field of employment, uh, education, violence, to uh, just name a few. Uh, and in addition, um, there is a lack of compliance on procedural guarantees and safeguards for asylum seekers, uh, which are already 
uh, set out in the EU uh, asylum law, especially for LGBT applicants. And that uh, procedure is becoming lengthy and uh, outcomes are unpredictable more and more, uh, which in turn uh, coupled with poor reception countries um, in, in, uh, and social uh, precariousness uh, have impact on the well-being of LGBT people, and uh, uh, also contributes to, to 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 the economic and social uh, precarity uh, of the LGBT people that sometimes they prefer. As it was uh, already mentioned, that uh, lay low or hide and seek, where they do not get the um, essential services, uh, uh, and um, and. And these people are who, in many cases, have undergone traumatic experiences uh, back home or on their way to the EU. Um, and uh, so these are the, some of the main challenges I wanted to highlight today, uh, of course, also because of the time limitation. And I will stop my intervention here uh, and looking forward to discuss it further. Well, thank you so much, Akram, for that very close read of the Dublin Three text. And we definitely pick up on the cis heteronormative assumptions that underlie a lot of how that text was created, right? And, and the whole construction of family as a, a, a category, a priority category in the hierarchy of vulnerabilities really shows us from your experience how LGBTIQ plus people's lives are not always well understood according to this framework, right? And then from that basis comes, you know, the, all the procedural challenges that you mentioned, the lack of compliance among member states, the outcomes being unpredictable, the, um, the waiting times getting longer while the the delays, as Rania mentioned earlier, granted for providing increasing amounts of evidence are getting shorter. So could I ask you to help us remember, towards the beginning of your presentation, Akram, you shared um, some citations from a court ruling. Could you help us remember which case that was for people who might not be familiar with it? Uh, I I do not have specifically here. Uh, I cannot recall, but there there are cases. But I can uh, share later on uh, with Menje, and Menje can just put it out. Um, right. Okay. Thank you. That would be really helpful. I mean, I think what you shared with us is very detailed, and I think people would certainly appreciate learning a bit more about the Article Seventeen Sovereignty Clause and the humanitarian clauses that may be helpful. I'm looking at Rania's face though and thinking that perhaps they're not always very helpful. Um, yeah, yeah, Irene, I just wanted to also add uh, that mm -hmm. it's very, it's very rarely used by member states, I should note. Even though this allows to them to exercise their sovereignty rights, but it's barely, very rarely used. Mm. But it can be used, what, what I wanted to highlight. It can be used, but it's not used. So there's something else going on behind the non-use of that. Which brings us to Eleni, who is in a very unique position at the head of the SOGI unit at the Council of Europe, uh, one of the most influential bodies within the EU governance ecosystem on protecting the rights of LGBTIQ plus people on European territories. So it's not an asylum, it's not the asylum office, but the Council of Europe has a very important role in safeguarding these rights. So I would like to ask you, Eleni, as the director of the Council of Europe SOGI unit, could you help us understand the COE's role, some key instruments and decisions with respect to LGBTIQ plus refugees and asylum seekers in Europe, as well as the member states' responsibilities to uphold their rights? Thank you. You're on mute. 
And you're also, can we hear Eleni? Can anybody hear Eleni? Okay. May I call on our technical team, Menja and Mohammed, to help? Because I think Eleni has, is having a little bit of trouble getting her voice to, to pick up on Zoom. And she's also link, I think she's coming in on the link under my name. Okay, while we are sorting out this technical issue, may I, before we move to, we're gonna give Eleni and our technical team a, a minute to try to establish a reconnection of the audio. In the meantime, I have a question for Rania that's come through for you in the chat, okay? And the question is from Ari, and Ari asks, he says that, Ari says, I appreciate the panel very much. For Ms. Carroll, I have a question. Which paragraph were you referring to when you were talking about LSVD Cologne? I think you might have also been mentioning the Article 17, but I'm not sure. So this is a question from Ari Kerr. Uh, yes, I was referring to the 17 because that's what we what we actually uh, and somehow try to convince uh, the the migration office uh, if if we uh, if we start to 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 get in touch with those people because honestly mostly the problem is that uh, the moment we uh, that's my experience the moment we get in touch with the with uh, with the asylum seekers uh, in terms of the uh, the Dublin procedure we are mostly already that they got a negative decision. Um, and then we that's that's very difficult to get then another time in touch with the with the Bundesamt uh, with, the, with the migration office, but that's what 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 uh, what we started and somehow to refer to the to the seventeen, yeah. And in my opinion, that the that's the only chance we we might get on. Um, um, yeah. I, I would I would love to to add something because in in my my opinion there's always in in somehow a misunderstanding of the family reunion because we really have to consider that fa family reunion is only regarding minor and their parents and their relatives and the other way around and <clears throat> what we are facing on. Uh, in terms of, uh, of of homosexual is more often uh, that we have really uh, already adults and that they do have have partners and so we are we are mostly or if we talk about family we talk about uh, we talk about partners and that's even for heterosexuals uh, very difficult uh, to to get reunioned with only a partner if you are not married, that that's something I I wanted to add at the time. Perhaps we have Irene now. Thank you. Thank you, Rania. I mean, I think that all of you who've spoken so far have mentioned something really important, which is you know what constitutes a family under Dublin Three and what actually is the reality of family experience for LGBTIQ plus refugees and asylum seekers, right? From what you're saying, you know, um, even though there is some promise of being able to use Article 17, there's still uh, the assumption of what constitutes a, a, a family within Dublin Three can remain very problematic because family is a source of persecution for queer refugees and asylum seekers. And then, as you both mentioned, Akram and Rania, um, the concept of chosen family, you know, for the purposes of family reunification or for uh, obtaining asylum with one's partner or a close person that does not have that biological relationship is something I think a lot of 
asylum jurisdictions will still need time to learn about. And perhaps that's one of the frontiers that we face next. Um, okay, I'm just gonna thank you, Lilith, for your, your remarks in the Q&A about the concept of family, really encourage people to weigh in. Um, while Eleni is sorting out her audio Zoom connection. Oh, but you're here. Eleni, can you hear us? You are on mute. Eleni, can you try to unmute yourself? I'm terribly sorry. Uh, the Council of Europe system does not like so much Zoom, so I, I had to go. I had to go on my phone. My colleagues uh, tried their best. I, I, I apologize. I was not able to to listen to the last uh, uh, presentations. Uh, so um, I will try to come into the discussion now. Uh, thank you very much for uh, um, inviting the Council of Europe. I, I have a terrible uh, flu and I am at home and probably my voice is not the best <laughs> for such a presentation, but I would really, really to thank you. Uh, this is an important, uh, a, a very uh, important, uh, I'm sorry, I'm using my phone, uh, symposium. And I do hope that uh, we'll have uh, some follow-ups because uh, this is a topic that the Council of Europe has taken up um, for some years now, together with UNHCR, uh, we are organizing uh, capacity building trainings in the member states on, uh, on this particular topic. Um, we are hoping now to uh, start um, cooperation with EASO on, on the same topic. So I would like to, to, to run you through uh, the human rights protection established by the Council of Europe uh, and uh, its institutions. Uh, it's going to be uh, probably a, a bit of boring uh, presentation, but I am happy to share with you uh, our presentation. It was uh, uh, prepared by my team. Uh, I have a lawyer working on this spe specific topic. Uh, so I'm a lawyer myself. So I, I, I will share with you after the meeting uh, this presentation because I think it's a very useful tool for uh, the people concerned, but especially for lawyers working uh, in the member states uh, on this uh, particular topic. So uh, I, will, I, will first, uh, uh, I will first present you uh, our success story. And our success story is the European Court of Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights, and uh, the uh, protection of uh, asylum seekers uh, through uh, uh, this system. So from the beginning, I have to uh, uh, clarify that the, the European Convention on Human Rights does not include the right to asylum. But the member states of the Council of Europe are under the obligation to secure to everyone within their jurisdiction, everyone, not only the citizens, everyone who is in the territory of the member state, including LGBTI asylum seekers, the respect of the rights guaranteed by the European Convention on Human Rights. So in this context, and in particular, we are talking about the 47 member states, which include, of course, uh, uh, the uh, Dublin uh, EU member states. In this context, and in particular concerning LGBTI persons, the most relevant uh, rights are the Article 2, which guarantees the right to life, and Article 3, which prohibits torture, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. These articles have been interpreted by the European uh, Court of Human Rights as providing protection against all forms of return to places where there is a real risk that an individual would be subjected to irreparable harm. So 
it is what we what we uh, what we call uh, the European Convention on Human Rights is uh, a living instrument. So the court interprets the articles of the convention according to uh, uh, the current situation uh, in the member states. So there, there, there is this an evolving, uh, this is an evolving uh, case law concerning the, uh, the uh, asylum, um, LGBT asylum seekers. So um, the court's interpretation of the articles two and three has evolved, as I said, and the, into an expression, so you 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 have to to keep this expression is very important. Is the non refoulement principle? Articles two and three of the convention also prohibit and the indirect refoulement, which means an expulsion to a state from where migrants may face further deportation without a proper assessment of their situation. So this, this of course, as you can imagine, applies in the context of the Dublin regulation. And this is uh, the topic we're discussing today. So article three, two and three, indirect refoulement. The court has interpreted these obligations to include that an LGBTI person risking persecution amounting to the treatment contrary to Article 2 and 3 of the Convention on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity may not be sent back to their country of origin. The European Court of Human Rights has ruled that asylum seekers should not be required to lie or to exercise restraint about their sexual orientation or other protected characteristics. In its recent non-refoulement case concerning the risk of ill treatment for reasons of sexual orientation upon return to Gambia. So this is a very recent uh, judgment. It's B and C against Switzerland 2020. The court also clarified that the lack of the inadequate risk assessment by domestic authorities would breach article three. I should mention that in the past, similar cases have been either struck out or have been declared inadmissible. So you can see how the uh, European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence has evolved and now uh, covers uh, also uh, this particular case of violation. And it is an, a great tool in, in the hands of uh, practitioners, um, this jurisprudence. Another article, which is of the relevance in the context of LGBTI asylum seekers, is the Article 5, which allows for detention only in a limited number of circumstances. In our context, this concerns the detention of LGBTI persons pending the assessment of the asylum claim or if their claim has been rejected, it concerns their detention pending their deportation. So I give you an example in, uh, in a case against Hungary in 2016, OM versus uh, Hungary, the court found that the authorities had failed to make an individualized assessment or take into account the applicant's vulnerability within the detention facility when they ordered the applicant's detention without considering the extent to which vulnerable individuals were safe or unsafe in custody among other detained persons. In this case, the court held that LGBTI individuals are particularly vulnerable group of asylum seekers. In addition, in the recent case, again versus Hungary, is Rana versus Hungary 2020, the court extended the right of legal gender recognition for transgender refugees. The court noted that the domestic system for LGR had excluded the applicant simply because he did not have a birth certificate from Hungary a change in the birth register being the way name and gender changes were legally recognized. So some important uh, uh, judgments 
Uh, the most important uh, are, of course, the ones of uh, 2020, uh, which the court uh, has issued, and now we are expecting uh, the execution of these judgments. Now, the Council of Europe in 2010 adopted a specific recommendation, the Committee of Ministers' uh, uh, recommendation, to member states on measures to combat discrimination grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. So this is uh, our mandate. Uh, the SOGI unit operates based on this mandate of this uh, recommendation of the Committee of Ministers. And this covers uh, different uh, rights. And of course, uh, the uh, right to asylum is one of those. It is the first instrument of its kind and it is specific, uh, identifies specific measures to be adopted and effectively enforced by member states in order to combat discrimination based on SOGS. So this we are working we, 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 through our cooperation activities with member states for the implementation of this particular recommendation and of course, through the execution of judgments for the member states that they are concerned. So this, uh, as I mentioned before, it has, there is a specific thematic section on the right to asylum and calls on member states to respect the principle of non refoulement to adopt measures to protect LGBT asylum seekers and those deprived of their liberty from risk or physical and verbal violence to ensure the access to information. Every four years, uh, uh, my unit uh, is going back to the member states and uh, asks whether they have uh, uh, fully implemented or not this recommendation. So this is what we did. We call it a review of the implementation of the recommendation. This is what we did in 2018. So um, in the specific, uh, and this was the second review since the recommendation was adopted. So uh, in this specific uh, topic, a majority of states reported that a well-founded fear of persecution based on SOGI is recognized. So it seems that uh, uh, um, uh, there is a, this type of recognition in the majority of our member states. In the most of cases, of course, the, the recognition is indirect. Uh, so we have to trust uh, uh, the responses that the member states uh, uh, gave to the Council of Europe. Um, not all Council of Europe member states have explicitly recognized uh, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity or sex characteristics in their asylum laws. And this we can confirm. Uh, the explicit recognition in domestic law of LGBTI protection needs more attention. This is the recommendation that we gave back to the member states states following this, uh, this exercise. Now, the legal protection of transgender asylum seekers has rarely been addressed in the responses. So it seems that uh, uh, in this particular topic, member states uh, have not done uh, their homework. And, and this uh, uh, raises particular concerns uh, for the protection of the rights of transgender refugees. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is important that the specific measures are implemented to ensure that transgender asylum seekers have access to staff appropriately trained. Uh, 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 and this is uh, the work that the, the SOGI unit is trying to do with other agencies to uh, provide a specific training. Now, to, uh, always about transgender asylum, transgender uh, asylum seekers, measures addressing the specific condition of conditions of asylum centers, uh, one of our recommendations must be implemented to ensure that transgender asylum seekers have access to partic particular healthcare if required, as uh, such as hormone replacement therapy or to prevent discrimination, harassment and violence uh, both from uh, staff or other asylum seekers. So this is this this uh, um, uh, review of the implementation recommendation took place in uh, 2018. Uh, we are working now on a thematic review. Um, 
for the time being, uh, the LGBTI asylum seekers, uh, it was not part uh, in 2021, we, we dealt with the legal gender recognition uh, legislation, but uh, it's going to be one of our thematic reviews. So we'll see uh, what the member states have achieved. And of course, uh, we are working with them to improve uh, the legal and policy framework on this particular topic. Another institution of the Council of Europe, which is, has also a monitoring role, but not only, uh, this is the Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, and uh, we think the, uh, in 2018, the Commissioner for Human Rights issued a human rights comment on the protection of LGBT asylum seekers. So it is very important source of information and um, not only for the member states, uh, but to uh, see, uh, the commissioner uh, see um, repeats the standards that they are established uh, uh, by the Council of Europe. So she called on the member states to ensure that their laws explicitly recognize a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity and sex characteristics. And she found that there is an urgent need for practical guidance and training for all those involved in the asylum procedure, including interviewers, decision makers, and interpreters, and that the authorities should make full use of resources already available and cooperate with the civil society groups to develop trainings. In addition, she recommended that member states engage in further research and exchange about how to ensure safe reception conditions for LGBT asylum seekers. So uh, the commissioner um, in, in, in her monitoring work uh, and in her field visits, uh, my, uh, asylum seekers is one of the priorities. She always takes up uh, uh, the topic of LGBT asylum seekers. Spe specific recommendations are made to the, uh, to the governments and uh, exchange of uh, le letters uh, takes place after each visit. They're not necessarily public, but this is a part of the uh, diplomacy uh, uh, that the Council of Europe applies uh, with the member states. Uh, Finally, I would like to, to, to run you through the work of the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, which is um, another monitoring body of the Council of Europe. And uh, uh, ECRI in 2015, in, in, the, in its fifth report on Estonia, noted that Estonian domestic legislation does not explicitly recognize persecution on the basis of sexual orientation as a valid ground for asylum requests. So a specific recommendation to Estonia was made, but as I said, this is not the only country. The, um, uh, the last point that we'd like to take up is uh, the work of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, an extensive work um, on uh, uh, asylum, uh, on asylum, on, on LGBT, and specifically on asylum. Uh, just to uh, to remind you, there is a resolution of 2015 after doubling the urgent need for a real European asylum sister system. This is a resolution which was. Uh, adopted uh, in uh, 2015 and takes up the specific uh, situation of the Dublin system. So I will probably have the opportunity to, um, to share with you some good practices, uh, but I, would I, I will stop here. Thank you very much and apologies for this uh, uh, connection issue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eleni, for your patience and for joining us despite your cold and the connection issues. It is really wonderful to hear your perspectives on what the Council of Europe has been doing quite actively uh, to advance on the topic of ensuring protection for LGBTIQ plus people who are seeking protection in Europe. Um, and it's great to hear about your cooperation efforts with the United Nations Refugee Agency and also with EASO. Thank you also for 
kind of drawing our attention back to the protections that are set forth in the European Convention on Human Rights and helping us understand a bit about the uh, recommendations that you're implementing or asking member states to implement and that review process. So it is really quite encouraging to hear that many states within the 47 state block of the Council of Europe do recognize well-founded fear of persecution based on SOGI, although this is not the case for every country. And it's also really encouraging to hear about the work that you're doing to protect trans refugees and asylum seekers, which I do think is one of the frontier, so-called frontier challenges that LGBTIQ plus um, displaced people and everyone who's working with them face today. So thank you again for helping us to understand a little bit of the complexity of the EU human rights and asylum architecture as it applies to sexual orientation and gender identity, expression and sex characteristics. And do look forward to hearing your recommendations. Just checking the time here. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to go to the section on what can we do better? Okay, so what is already working? I think if we were going to really do a deep dive into challenges, we could be on this Zoom call all week, but every one of you is also engaged in work that is already having some positive results, even if they don't seem to be monumental. But I think it will be really helpful to hear your views on what is working or what could be considered, you know, um, as a good practice to take forward. So a good practice that you're either already doing or that could be put into place. Would anybody like to go first? I'm seeing some people being a little reticent, so I'm going to call on people. I'm going to call on Rania first. Rania, you're on mute. Uh, I, 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 I'm still a little bit puzzled by what, what Lenny said, because uh, I, uh, I do see mainly the problem that if we are facing on Dublin 3, uh, all the member countries, or what, what my experience is, Germany is not considering that as asylum procedure. That's my, my, my first concern. Uh, it's always concerned as kind of pre or or something a part of the asylum procedure and that's what we what we what we need to change uh, the question of of non refoulement that's something what in my in my daily business that that's that had been more questions for afghanistan and so in the past but uh, we are facing on in the dublin procedure mainly that uh, uh, this this group is not really uh, really considered as a special group as a vulnerable group and uh, what they what they do expect every time in avoiding is this highly barrier of of real risk or re real fear what they are facing on in other european member states and I would really love that we will come to the conclusion that this group needs more protection than that, because it's a vulnerable group and, and the barrier of that they need to, to prove that in another European country, they are really facing uh, in humanitarian conditions. That's something that I, as a lawyer, I will not get uh, uh, the right in front of court because the court will not accept that I consider France as not being able to take care about uh, LGBTIQ plus members in, in general. So that's what I'm facing on. And, and I'm really dreaming of that we might come in the future to the conclusion that this group needs more protection really apart what's considered from the human humanitarian right uh, because even the, but that's that's something for another panel 
that I have really to fight on for uh, for the asylum than further on for some countries where we would all or where we all know that they have problems, but here in Germany they are not considered as as asylum seekers in the end. So uh, I, I would love to bring an example of what I did in the past because in in my daily practice I I, I need to. To, to to stay with the with the with the people or with with the person in front of me on a focus and and in in claiming and claiming just to the to to the high court is not he, helping him in his daily daily stay here in in Europe so uh, I was facing on in the past really two uh, two two uh, yeah it was two mostly at the same time people who came over France asylum seekers gay ones and and i said to them okay we 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 might claim against uh but i said i will have no chance if if i have to explain uh, in front of court that they are really fe- facing high risk as homosexuals in 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 france it, it, that's that's more and less ridiculous they will say to me are you yeah but but we all know that in general asylum seekers uh, in france they uh, just as they are accepted they are living on the street uh so what 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 then uh came up to me is okay we really try uh in somehow to uh grab the uh the authorities uh by something which is also written in the regulation that they might really uh, uh, try to get an uh, an audit transfer and it was almost taking me uh, as much uh, work as claiming and everything because uh, i think they 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 were so so stubborn that somebody was really calling and i said okay uh, we want to do that and first question or well, the, the first answer was okay uh, if if he books a fly and he's paying for everything he he might go to france and i said you are not allowing them to work who should pay for for the fly to to france uh, that's very interesting and then said okay no then you 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 might you might you might do that uh then it will cost germany a price of police and everything um but uh in 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 one of the cases and that was really something i i'm 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 still happy was with the uh, i i managed to get in touch with uh, france or homophobie uh, no, uh, an no an organization I, yeah I also, um Mm-hmm. And 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 so really, we managed to organize everything in France, uh, and I convinced the administration that they really were kind of giving me uh, uh, the day of the flight, the flight number, and everything. Uh, we couldn't cancel uh, the police getting him uh, in the <laughs> in the camp was very in- interesting <laughs> for the police to get to grab somebody for a transfer who was waiting in front of the building with his backpacks and everything uh and finally he he went to marseille and there was uh, somebody from the organization really w- w- waiting for him and and uh, and and they were taking care and i was really touched because they hosted him for for several months uh, just the asylum uh, procedure uh, went on and and finally he got uh, accepted in france that's that's what i did but i felt i felt really sad uh, to to realize that even for the administration to go this way it took me so much uh, uh, time to convince the administration that that he will really go freely and that they have they really do not need to doubt that he will really go so that i said normally it's it's uh, yeah it's it's implemented in the regulation as as possibility but that's not something which is which is lived and unfortunately the other practice what what i do see what what in bavaria started to be uh, to be part is the church asylum uh because i do not see that that uh i i will yeah perhaps it might be a chance now to get uh, to win a claim against a transfer to poland or uh, hungary um but i do even still have doubts 
uh, that for a Dublin case, I would I would win that. Uh, so what what uh, I know most LGBTI plus uh, Dublin cases are facing on actually is church asylum to pass over the six months delay and we are fighting for not prolongation of eighteen months. That's that's what what actually is. So I'm honestly really counting on on the future that new discussions over these accordings uh, uh, come more to the conclusion that we need uh, more respectation of this vulnerable group. Thank you so much, Branya. I really appreciate your sharing from your experience working with the CSOs in transfer countries in France, for example, and the need to make us national authorities understand and take seriously, recognize the, the real risks faced by LGBTIQ plus people, indeed a very vulnerable group. And thank you also for mentioning church asylum, something we could get a little more deeply into in another panel. Uh, before we go on, I just want to recognize that we have 15 minutes left in our webinar. The time has flown by and I'm going to ask your forgiveness in advance if we move a little bit quickly through the next set of recommendations from Akram and Eleni because we have several questions that I would like to touch on before we wrap up in uh, 15 minutes. Um, so, Akram and Eleni, which one of you would like to go next? Yeah, I can uh, just wrap up. Sure. I have very, very general uh, recommendation at the EU level. Okay. Um, so, as I just wanted to sum up this. We can see from the today's discussion, there's a pressing need to actually reform the Dublin procedure uh, at its core. And it should start with the rethinking of how to build a genuine and fair common asylum policy. Uh, so first of all, it should be fair and efficient one for the applicants and not for the states as, as it is uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, but we do see that uh, in the current reform, which is uh, go going on under the, uh, this new pact on asylum and, uh, and migration, uh, which commission put forward, that most of the, um, most of the provisions of the current uh, Dublin uh, system uh, remains uh, and the criteria, uh, they also remain. And uh, we do understand that's because of the highly political uh, um, uh, opposing interests that they should find a compromise. But at the moment, uh, during this uh, revision of the uh, 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 this common European uh, asylum system, and specifically on how uh, the application will be uh, reviewed within the European Union, within the members of the European Union, we would uh, recommend that uh, what was said uh, uh, already that at the least in the uh, criteria, um, or maybe uh, not only criteria, but also the vulnerability aspect of the applicant should be explicitly mentioned uh, in, the, uh, in the regulation. And also it should uh, explicitly mention LGBTI people uh, as a group. Uh, for the exceptions, uh, so this would be the the least uh, what uh, the Commission, uh, Parliament, and the Council could do at the moment. Uh, and I will stop here. Uh, I can also give some of the examples, but I think I will stop just here and give to Eleni. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to reply to um, the question before, uh, I mean. Following the, uh, the review of the implementation of the recommendation, the member states reported that uh, a well-founded fear of persecution based on SOGI is recognized. Now, this is what the member states uh, 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 said to the Council of Europe. Uh, from our uh, research, we know that not all Council of Europe member states have explicitly recognized SOGI as in their asylum uh, law. So uh, I confirm that uh, definitely uh, we need uh, more protection and uh, um, we need to work with member states, not only Germany, but definitely Germany 
uh, um, on this particular topic. Now, uh, recommendations, uh, as I said, uh, they have been um, formulated by uh, by the Commissioner uh, for Human Rights and our Parliamentary Assembly uh, has already expressed criticism about the functioning of the Dublin system, uh, mm -hmm. co concluding that the system is uh, dysfunctional. Uh, it is not effective and is certainly not efficient in achieving, in achieving its basic aims and its operation in practice has an unacceptably high human cost for asylum applicants and resource costs to participating states. So, um, and so this is uh, uh, the, the, the Parliamentary Assembly called on the European Union and its member states to urgently revise the Dublin regulation. Uh, this is what I can say for the time being. Uh, I think the most strong protection system is the one that is established by the European Convention on Human Rights. And there you don't have only recommendations, but you have a, a, a case law uh, judgments uh, that the member states should uh, effectively implement. Thank you so much, Eleni, for helping us remember, you know, the, the foundational buttress of that, which is the European Convention on Human Rights. And for helping us understand, you know, what the Council of Europe is doing to uh, to suggest improvements on the common European asylum system. I think from what all of you have shared, there is a need to, to update it so that it is uh, fair and accountable to asylum seekers in as much as it tries to do that with member states. So moving along, we'd like to present a couple of questions for you. I think we have nine minutes left um, and the first question is, and any of you can jump in on this, came from a little earlier in our webinar today. Claudia is asking, is the Istanbul Convention, which combats gender-based violence, specifically Article 61 and 62, can these be used as a ground for humanitarian protection? Does anyone want to weigh in on that? Well, this is a Council of Europe convention, and there should be. <laughs> it is a question addressed to me, although I don't work for the Istanbul Convention. Um, and uh, of course, the Istanbul Convention covers uh, the cases of uh, lesbian and transgender uh, women. And of course, uh, it can be used uh, um, uh, in uh, in the cases uh, of when requesting uh, international protection. Of course, uh, as you as you probably know, uh, the Istanbul Convention uh, is has a binding effect only for the for the uh, member states that they have signed and ratified the convention. Thank you so much. Eleni, we have a question from Sophia Sisaku who asks, do you think that considering LGBTIQ plus asylum seekers claims for family reunification with their partners in cases where the partner is a refugee or an asylum seeker? Under Article 17.2 of the Dublin Three, not under binding provisions of the regulation that would be Articles 9 and 10. Would this constitute a discrimination towards LGBTIQ plus families? So using Article 17 of Dublin 3. Uh, I can jump in, Irene. Sure. Uh, yes, I touched these uh, articles. Mm -hmm. uh, I think actually that uh, as um, we can see in the article two of the definition as to what's the family member, uh, this is, uh, it can be interpreted as a LGBT inclusive, as maybe Sophie already knows, but it also depends on the what in these uh, member states, in the specific member states, 
uh, who they um, consider as uh, uh, spouses, for example, uh, legally, and they and they also uh, require very different types of types of document. How you can prove that you are in the long stable uh, relations uh, to be considered, for example, as your spouse or uh, de facto spouse. And that's why it should be considered under the mentioned articles. But uh, I was talking that Article 17 can be also used in the cases when uh, there is no legal ground at the national level uh, to, for example, to consider uh, de facto families as a families under their national laws. They can also uh, apply this. And if country uh, doesn't apply, uh, it's my personal opinion, and my personal opinion, it, it, it will be discrimination based on the sexual orientation or gender identity or sex characteristics. In, in, in this case, if uh, LGBT families, uh, de facto families are not recognized, but uh, at the same time, the uh, uh, heterosexual families uh, are recognized. So that we can see why it, it might be happening. But at the same time, I think that uh, under the EU law, the uh, what's defined as a family so far, um, I think has has been uh, under the uh, discretion of the member states. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, until recently, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Rania, before I ask you to unmute, we have one final question coming in from Pavel Matus at the City of Light. I only wanted to, 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 yeah. to add something because your question was, uh, sorry to, to add, because we need probably to clarify the other question, because in the beginning it was, it was, it was uh, two asylum seekers or already somebody who was accepted in, in one country. That's something what we really have to dis distinguish. Because if we if we do have a really accepted asylum uh, uh, so so called refugee in Germany, and he went to be reunion uh, with with uh, with his partner, then we are out of the Dublin uh, three accordings. That's only was what I really wanted to 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 put in because then we we are really on the, in a, on another level because then we are in the ordinary familial reunion, right. Thank you for clarifying, Rania. Finally, before we wrap up, one last question from Pavel, the City of Leipzig Migrant Council, who asks, could you please share any experience or ideas of working for LGBTIQ plus refugees at local and regional policy levels? Any thoughts? City councils play a really important role in welcoming and integrating queer refugees and asylum seekers. Go ahead, Brian. You're on mute. Uh, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm fretting on uh, the really open the problem that a lot of those refugees uh, coming here is really not aware that LGBTI uh, plus uh, uh, problems are really uh, something with they what they absolutely need to mention, and I would uh, would would really love to uh, first of all also the the office mi of migration migration that that we all insist that that in in their first questionnaires what they what they get uh, there's never shown the word LGBTIQ as vulnerable group or in the questionnaires really in all the Dublin procedure uh, it's not showing up. So uh, I would really love uh, if all these organizations, they would really start to put in all those informations they distribute to the people. Uh, in the beginning, that there must be some informations about LGBTIQ. Uh, in, 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 in terms of, that's what we, what we discussed with those social workers in one time, uh, only a rainbow sticker on a, on an, on an head screen, uh, might, might symbolize something that the person feels, uh, ready to, to, to touch or, yeah, to, to talk about the topic, uh, or, or flyers lying around that they are really ki kind of consultancy, uh, uh, possibilities and that's really something what I really would wish to 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 have since the beginning because I'm realizing that the problem is really for them to get an access to the to the good informations from the beginning in arriving here. Thank you so much. 
We have one minute left. May I invite the, the three speakers? You have about 10 seconds to share any last words, 10 seconds of peace, and then we're gonna close it for, for now. Okay, Akram. Yes, thank you very much, Irene, for the perf uh, very good, uh, excellent moderation. And I, I also thank uh, Eleni, uh, Ronia, and Suma, even though she's not here, for sharing uh, your also expertise. And I learned a lot. And uh, uh, at, at last, and but not at the least, I want to thank you, all the organizers, uh, for uh, for having us and actually having uh, organized this uh, really important meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, from my side, I have 10 seconds. So in these 10 seconds, I cannot uh, uh, develop the work of the Council of Europe in capacity <laughs> building in member states. Mm -hmm. Definitely the, the local dimension is very important. Uh, we are very uh, new uh, in this uh, uh, sector. Uh, I must, uh, we, we build up our expertise as the UNHCR is the international organization dealing with this uh, um, with this topic specifically, but we bring into the UNHCR's work and the EASU works our expertise on LGBTI issues. So we are starting now a quite ambitious program of capacity building in member states, especially the member states like Greece, Turkey, uh, Switzerland, uh, Ireland, in the, in the member states where we, we know that their system um, needs to be improved and uh, to provide them with adequate tools to uh, uh, recognize and to protect uh, LGBTI asylum seekers. So thank you. Thank you very much for inviting Council of Europe. I do hope this is just a, a, a beginning. We, we will have the opportunity to share with you our work uh, and to assist uh, the people, the activists and the practitioners working in the field uh, uh, with the tools and um, and also to have some cooperation activities if they wish uh, in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And Ronya, 10 seconds. Now, I, I, I also say thank you to everybody in joining because I really, it's, it's really a topic which, uh, which I am connected my heart on. Uh, and I really uh, appreciate this kind of uh, a form of reunion, bringing all those different uh, point of views together. This might really bring uh, bring this topic forward, and and I look forward that there might be some some ameliorations in future. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I just want to thank everyone here: uh, Akram, Ronya, Eleni, Menja, Inez, Mohamed. I see Joe and Laura in the background. Suma has left the room. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join your conversation. It has been a real privilege and honor to moderate. I look forward to hearing about all your work and I hope that there will be another conversation to come where we pick up on the excellent work that you're all doing. So thank you again. <laughs>